I just want to welcome everybody to our webinar today. This is all about how you can apply for the Youth Innovation Challenge, which is all about tackling marine debris in creative ways. And we are really excited that you are here to find out more about the challenge. We're so excited about what is going to come in as part of this challenge. My name is Judy Browse, and I'm the Executive Director of the North American Association for Environmental Education, or NAAAE, as we say. And we are the Secretariat of the JEEP, the Global Environmental Education Partnership. And today we are going to start with a few opening remarks and introductions. And then you'll get a chance to find out how much you know about marine debris with a few trivia questions from Nina. Then we'll hear from Dr. Ko to learn more about the issues associated with marine debris. Then Madeline will tell you more about the Youth Innovation Challenge and we'll close with some tips and tricks so that uh, with Nina so that uh, you can all feel better about your applications and help you as you're applying. And at the end, we'll take questions to make sure that we can answer any questions that you might have. So that's what we're hoping to do today. Really happy that you could join. For those of you who might not know Zoom, it's a wonderful platform, but everybody is muted except the presenters, but you can talk with us through the chat. You can either send a note to all the presenters who you can see on camera, or you can send a note to everyone. Like if you have a question, please go ahead and send it to everyone because somebody else probably has that question as well. I also wanted to let you know that you can click on the closed caption button so that you could read along as people are talking. Because we know that English is not everybody's first language. So if you have any questions too about the technology, you can just put it in the chat and one of us will get back to you about that. And just a little bit about um, the Global Environmental Education Partnership the Youth Innovation Challenge is a project of the Jeep, and the Jeep is all about creating a learning partnership around the world to strengthen environmental education and really use the power of education to address the environmental and the social issues that we face. And it started as a partnership between US EPA, Taiwan, EPA, the Environmental Protection Administration in Taiwan, and NAAAE. And we work with advisors and partners around the world, like our friends at the Ocean Affairs Council, who are partnering with us on the Youth Innovation Challenge. And I just wanted to recognize the Jeep team at NAAAE that includes Anne Umali, the Director of Professional Development, Nina Hamilton, the Senior Manager of International Programs, and Madeline Halvey, our International Programs Coordinator. They are all fantastic. And I also want to give a huge thanks to the team at the Ocean Affairs Council in the Ocean Conservation Administration in Taiwan. Thanks to the entire team. Whoops, excuse me, here we go. Julia Huang is the Director General. Jimmy, the Section Chief, we're really excited to have you. And eBay, wonderful partners. And you will get a chance to hear in just a minute from Julia. And we have been so lucky to work with this terrific team talking about such important issues dealing with ocean conservation, marine debris, and what we can all do to build stewards for the future. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Huang. And I'm going to stop sharing here and turn it over to Madeline. And Dr. Huang is the Director General of the Ocean Conservation Administration, which is part of the Ocean Affairs Council. She started her official career in the fisheries section in the Bureau of Agricultural, Agriculture in Taipei County Government. And then she moved to national and international fisheries work and was responsible for distance water fisheries management and working with many international partners to help conserve marine resources. She started teaching and conducting research at National Taiwan Ocean University and has focused on issues including bycatch, tuna longline fisheries, and marine debris. The Ocean Conservation Administration was established in 2018 for conservation of the ocean around Taiwan, and Dr. Huang was appointed as the Director General. And she focuses on issues for marine conservation, environmental protection and pollution, habitat restoration, and international cooperation. And she also oversees conservation education initiatives like this 
and helps connect Taiwan with international community, the international community and helps strengthen public private partnerships and encourage stewardship of our marine resources. So let's give her a warm virtual welcome. And Julie, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Judy. Uh, I'm good morning, good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm Julia Huang from Ocean Conservation Administrations. And uh, I would like to express my appreciation to the great NAAEE for running YIC for a second year and organizing this webinar. Yeah, Judy, thank you for your great team. And uh, I am also grateful to uh, Dr. Cole as an expert in this field, will share her experience with us today. So uh, let me, let's go to the next uh, slide. Next slide, please. So uh, actually our uh, previous one, yeah, our administration just established in 2018. So uh, in the beginning, we established our region, the three major regions, including clear waters, health habitat, and uh, of course, sustainable fisheries. So for this purpose, we'll need to do uh, many scientific research and uh, information data transparency. And uh, also very important, the public and the private sector operations and the outreach and education. So to accomplish this goal, we have been addressing the marine debris as one of the most difficult part challenge in the beginning. So next slide, please. So let me briefly introduce you what we have done in the past four years. So first, we consider the scientific research is very important. So, so we establish a monitoring system. We try to survey and monitor the marine debris density and distributions for those floating marine debris, bottom marine debris, and also the microplastic in seawater and in oysters and other by, uh, animals. And after we collect and analyze this information, we can know the hot spot where those marine debris are and what type so we can try to find the resolution and uh, conduct them on the hot spot. So the second, we try to uh, remove all the marine debris as many as possible. We invite many fishermen and divers to join our team to collect and remove them. Then go to the next step. We try to recycle them and try to make it more useful. No previous one. So you can see uh, the third step, the recycling pilot progress. We try to buy back some, uh, including a fishing net and a styrofoam to recycle it. And uh, of course, during the process, the education and the advocacy is very important. We make many uh, materials and try to uh, collect with others. So the last one about the international cooperation and the promotion, like this, important activities. We cooperate with the uh, United States and uh, try to invite all young people to join our work together, try to find the resolution to clean the ocean. So uh, next slide, please. So here I would like to show you the story process. We try to invite as many, as many people as possible. So here for now, we have uh, more than 5,000 vessels can join us, try to clean those marine debris on ocean. And also more than 3,000 scuba divers try to uh, collect those marine debris on the bottom. So you can see this one trip, we collect a lot of PET bottle from the bottom of the oceans. The next one, please. And also there are many uh, young and smart young people in Taiwan. So uh, I will raise two examples. Here we can see this a company we call Dian Dian Su, the micro PC technology company. They establish, uh, you can see that there's a small boat without uh, people, but this vessel can be automatically collect marine debris and uh, especially microplastic from the oceans. 
So uh, here has a link from the YouTube. So you can check uh, later, you can see the video to see how it works. And the uh, next one, please. And this is another one, it's bigger ones. And also now this, I think this is a, their not prototype, but the most recent boat. Also, you can collect the marine debris on the ocean. And also not only marine debris, but also collect many environmental parameters. So it will help people to know the surrounding, surrounding environment and also the marine debris and their correlations. So it will be more smart and more technology involved. Next one, please. So here's a, also in last year, the first YIC, there are many Taiwanese young people join the campaign. So this is one of them. They using those marine debris and smartly transform to art. So you can see their title is C, we art ready. They try to transform those marine debris to art so can collect, uh, can attract more attention from public and uh, as an uh, educational purpose. As, so they also got to, to be the winner last year. So here I want to raise this e example for you, your reference. So let me go to the end. So I think in general, uh, for all this activity, we try to raise environmental awareness, not only us, but also to the public. And uh, all together, we can try to reduce the marine debris and uh, working together for the healthy ocean. So in the finals, uh, I just want to mention that we cannot wait to see all amazing submission from you in the near future. So thank you and look forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong, for, for sharing more about your work and, and about your, um, your agency. We're, again, just to echo Judy, we're so happy that you were able to join us on this call. <clears throat> All right, so hello everyone again. I'm Nina Hamilton. I'm not sure I have introduced myself just yet, but I'm also thrilled to be here. So uh, we are so excited to also welcome Associate Professor Dr. Ko, who will give us an introduction to this very complex issue of marine debris. And we're thrilled to have her here to share with us her great uh, expertise and her experience with this topic. But first, next slide, we are going to see how much you already know about marine debris. Um, with some trivia. So we're going to have a few uh, questions here that we're gonna share with you. If you know the answer to the question, please type the answer in the chat. We do not have any prizes, <laughs> unfortunately, um, but if you get it correct, know that you did a great job. <laughs> um, so our first question, next slide is, by what year will ocean plastic way more than all the fish in the ocean. So if you know the answer to this question, or even if you don't, take a guess, put it in the chat. What year do you think ocean plastic will weigh more than all the fish in the ocean? Twenty fifty. 2035, I'm gonna let a few more guesses come in. Is there any, 2045, all right. Most of you were right, 2050. And those of you that, you, the rest of you were pretty close. So um, keep in mind, this is an estimate. <laughs> it, it's very hard to estimate when we're going to reach this point. It's also difficult to measure the weight of all of the fish in the ocean. Um, but this is coming up pretty soon. So if we if we keep going how we are with our consumption and our, our um, how we dispose of waste, we could reach that point by 2050. All right, great job. Next question. How long does it take for marine debris to decompose? If 
you have any ideas, put it in the chat. Five thousand years. That's a long time. A <laughs> hundred years. Great guesses. Five hundred. Any other guesses? I think we've got a pretty good, pretty good range of guesses here. Fifty years. All right. Next slide. This was a little bit of a trick question. It really depends on what type of marine debris you're talking about, whether it's plastic or glass or aluminum or fishing line or all of these other kinds of debris that we find in the ocean. Um, some of them, it can take more than 400 years, but I'm not going to go into this because Dr. Ko is going to, to do a little activity with you all in a little bit to explore how long these different uh, materials take to decompose. So, but it can be a very long time, I will tell you that. <laughs> all right, next question. What is the most common form of ocean litter? So what is the type of litter maybe that's most often found or most, most picked up on the beach perhaps? Plastic, good guess. Any other guesses? Bottles, more plastic. All right, lots of plastic. Oh, let's show them the answer. It is actually cigarettes. So this is not by weight. If you're thinking about weight, I, Dr. Ko would know the answer to this probably, but I believe plastic might be the, the answer if you're looking by weight. But if you're looking at the number of items, uh, it is actually cigarettes. And there are more recent numbers, but in 2017, uh, the Ocean Conservancy's report found that there were 2.4 million cigarettes uh, picked up as, as, ocean, as marine debris. Um, so I thought this was pretty surprising when I, was, when I was going through and researching these. All right, I think we have a couple more questions. The next question, how many species are affected by marine debris worldwide? So what's the total number of species, mammals, birds, all kinds of species. How many species are affected by marine debris worldwide? What do you all think? This is a more difficult one, huh? <laughs> 10,000, 100,000. <laughs> hundred million. <laughs> Great guesses. Any other guesses? Uncountable. That is a very good point. Yes. <laughs> All of that millions. All right. Well, we'll show them the answer. So um, a recent United Nations report found that over 800 species were directly affected by marine debris. Now, yes, I think you could argue it might go beyond 800. And if you're really interested in this, I encourage you to dive into these reports a little bit deeper. We'll share these with you. Um, we'll share the links with you after the webinar. Um, but you can dive into that report and see you know, how did they decide on this number 800? And could it be even bigger than that if you think about different kinds of impacts? All right, next question. How much, ocean, how much does ocean plastic pollution cost us each year in US dollars? So what is the economic cost of ocean plastic pollution each year? I'll give you a guess, it's a lot. I'll give you a hint. <laughs> It's, it's quite a bit of money. One billion, more than a billion. Any other guesses? Five billion. 
Yeah, any others? Also, thank you everyone for put it, for putting these guesses in the chat. <laughs> it's, it's really great to be hearing from all of you. Three billion. All right. The answer is at least 13 billion, according to uh, a 2014 UN environment report. So again, I think there are different estimates out there, but uh, this one report did find that it can the ocean plastic pollution can cost us over $13 billion, and that includes um, the, the damage that it causes to fisheries, to tourism, to all kinds of industry. Um, but that, of course, doesn't even maybe capture the impact on our human health on other aspects. So um, again, I, I encourage you to dive into those reports if, if you're interested in learning more. All right, I think we have one more question. Yes. How many garbage patches are there in our oceans? And if you're not sure what a garbage patch is, that's totally fine. We're going to go into it and Dr. Ko is going to uh, introduce you all to the concept to you, but throw out a guess. How many garbage patches do you think there are in our oceans? We've got two, any other guesses? Six, all right. Any other thoughts? Five, okay. Kara, you got it, it is five. So, oh, sorry, let me pull up my notes here, make sure I give you the right answer here. So there are five garbage patches in, in our oceans around the world. And so these garbage patches are large areas where marine debris, collect or they're they're very concentrated because of how our ocean currents are are set up and how they rotate around the world. And so we have five of these ocean gyres or gyres. I'm actually not sure exactly how to pronounce that, Dr. Ko, you might. Um, but we have five of these around the world and this is where these patches have formed. So we have one in the Indian Ocean, Indian, uh, Indian Ocean two in the Atlantic Ocean and two in the Pacific Ocean. And the largest, called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, some estimates uh, find that it might include 1.8 trillion pieces of trash in that garbage patch. Again, I think that's probably pretty hard to estimate, uh, but there's quite a bit of litter concentrated in these garbage patches in our oceans around the world. So. Dr. Ko is going to go even into more detail into that. This is just a little introduction. Um, but next slide, I think, yes. So I'm honored to pass it over to Associate Professor Dr. Ko to give you an even better introduction to the issue of marine debris. So thank you so much, Dr. Ko, for joining us. Okay, can everyone hear me? Mm hmm Yep. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night, everyone from the different country. This is my honor to be here to introduce marine debris for you. Uh, first, I will introduce myself briefly. I graduated from National Taiwan University. I'm actually interested in ecology and evolutionary biology. I have my experience at Stanford and Yale University. And uh, since 2013, I came back to Taiwan and joined uh, the research about environmental change as well as fishery science. So originally I actually focused on the climate change, but why in recent years I am interested in marine debris. So it's my, uh, I might get, uh, uh, myself as the example for you, and hopefully in the future, you will also join some marine debris work. Um, so just because I feel that I lost a great environment for my ecological survey, I find a lot of the marine debris along the Dongsha Island. So I feel very confused and I wanted to know where this trash came from and why they come, why they could come to Dongsha Island. So that, that, 
uh, start my marine debris research. So I will encourage everyone that if you uh, have some question about one thing, then I, I think you should find some way uh, to explore it. And maybe in the future, that will become your important work or important job uh, in your career or in your life. Okay, then we will start to go to the marine debris next. So let us uh, talk about the marine debris. Next, please. First, I would like to invite all participants to think about how long until this nature and human made products gone. Which item do you think you would have the longest lifespan? Please give me your answer in the chat box. Can everyone see the item? Okay, one say the plastic grocery bags. Any other question, any other answer? Which item do you think uh, you will have the longest lifespan? Buoy, glass bottles, plastic bottle. Any other answers? Fishing line, okay, I see, I saw the different answers. Okay, because of the time, we will go to see the answer. So let us see the next. Okay, generally you can find the natural products can be degraded within several months or a few years. So you can see there are uh, like some wood or the apple. Did you find the apple? It's on the top left. And however, human-made products will exist longer, even over a hundred years. So, and we can find this uh, several one, they, they, will ex uh, they will exist for uh, over than 100 years. The next, next please. So see, uh, that also mean when these products are in the ocean, they could affect marine environments for a long, long, long period, which we may not be able to image. So if you check, so you can, we can find the longest, at this, among these items, the longest item would be the fishing lines. But about how about the glass bottle? It is underestimate yet. Okay, next. So, what is marine debris? From National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, marine debris, or we call marine litter, ocean litter, ocean trash is divided as any persistent solid material that is manufactured or processed and directly or indirectly, intentionally or unintentionally, deposed of or abandoned into the marine environment or the great lake. Anything human made and solid can become marine debris once lost or littered in aquatic environments. Our trash has been found in every corner of our ocean from the most remote shorelines to ice in the Arctic and even the deepest part of the sea floor. The next. Here are the results of annual reports from the International Coastal Cleanup Program released by Ocean Conservancy. Since the 1980s, cigarette butts have consistently made up 30 to 14% of all items collected in annual international coastal and urban cleanups. That means cigarettes, which also top America's list of most littered things, have the long standing uh, distinctness of beginning the most littered uh, item on Earth. 
with about 4.5 trillion cigarettes discarded each year worldwide in 2018. So here I show the uh, three years report for you because I want you to have some comparison. Since the, uh, in 2018, the data started to provide a traveling uh, revolution that the problem of plastic pollution have reached a climax. So please go to the 2018, you can see that. The single most unfortunate and significant takeaway since the 2018 report was that for the first time in the 33 year history of the ICC program, all of the items in the top 10 most common items found, found were made of plastic. So you can compare the first one is cigarette, but from the uh, second, third, fourth, fifth, uh, most of them made of plastic. Even the cigarette, actually, if you can think they are covered, they also made some of them, the material are also plastic. So because of, uh, the plastic item uh, occupied so much composition, so this is why marine debris is often directly referred to as plastic. Next. However, uh, however I want all the participants to notice, although we found the cigarette uh, were, is the highest uh, marine debris uh, in the ICC program. But no, you should notice that above were the results from coastal area. So the litter may come both uh, terrestrial and oceanic sources. So here I also provide all of you for our uh, collection. Uh, based on our monthly simple collection over five years, from 20, uh, uh, 2020 to 2016 at Dongsa Island, uh, it's in the uh, South China Sea, which we confirm almost all marine debris were from ocean. So and we can find, so the, uh, the, the lie, uh, the styrofoam were the pri uh, primary source, source of both annual and monthly macro ocean litter in the waters surrounding the island, followed by plastic bottles, fishing gills and other plastic product. So you can find the, the, the most percentage was from the styrofoam. So it's a little bit, so you can see some difference between uh, our collection and the ICC report. And so you can really think about uh, the different uh, marine debris come from, collected come from the coastal area or uh, we confirm is really from the ocean uh, area. Um, so next. And after you know where uh, the composition of the marine debris, now I want to introduce the size of the marine debris. Marine debris can be categorized according to size and is defined for plastics as mega, greater than one meter uh, di diameter macro between 2.5 centimeter and uh, less than one meter uh, diameter meso between five millimeter and uh, less than 2.5 centimeter micro between 0 0.1 micro and less than five millimeter and narrow less than 0 0.1 uh, micrometer, micrometer. Such categorization of marine debris greatly improve our ability to compare contamination across studies and can contribute to determining the sources, transport and fat in the marine environment. So next. Here, I provide some figures for you to image how different sizes of marine debris may come from different types of plastic waste and different marine organisms may adver adversely affect it. So you can image the different size of the plastic, the marine debris, how they will met, how they come from, and how this different size of the marine debris will affect the different kinds of the marine organisms. Next. And as you know from the previous question, so the absurd proportions of plastic among marine debris worldwide are 35% till greater than 90%. And because uh, microplastic has recently received great attention in marine environmental issues, 
I additionally clarify two types of microplastic for you, primary versus secondary uh, microplastics. Primary microplastics are tiny particles designed for commercial use, such as cosmetics, as well as microfibers shared from clothing or other textiles, such as fishing nets. Secondary microplastics are particles that result from the breakdown of large plastic items, such as water bottles. Next. So if you remember the previous question that we just raised for you, so how many ocean drives of the world? So why the answer is five? Because an ocean dry is a large system of circular ocean currents formed by global wind uh, uh, patterns and forces create, uh, created by Earth's rotation. The movement of the world's major ocean giants helps draw, uh, draw the ocean uh, common young belt. These ocean conveyance belts are essential for regulating temperature, salinity, and nutrient flow throughout the ocean. But now, oceanographers and ecologists are concerned about these giants becoming considerable accumulation zones for floating plastics. Eventually, the debris makes its way to the center of the giant, where it becomes trapped and breaks down into a kind of the plastic soup. So, and so we call now, we call this kind of the situation is the plastic soup or garbage soup or garbage patches. Next. And after you know what is the marine debris and the size and different types of the marine debris, you also have the, some idea about the microplastics. I also want to show you what is the impact of marine debris. And this including biological impacts, environmental impact, and social and economic impacts. For biological impacts, when exposed to a marine debris pollution, Wildlife in aquatic and terrestrial environments face physical hazards from ingestion and entanglement. Animals that become entangled in debris risk suffocating or drowning. Many species mistake plastic debris for food or, in a, uh, in, or ingest plastic debris where feeding or swimming. Once ingest, this debris can damage their uh, the uh, digestive tract and interfere with an animal's ability to feed, leading to their die or negative health effects. Scientists have found that at least uh, 800 species, including turtles, seabirds, and marine mammals, are reported to have ingested or become entangled in plastic waste. Debris can also influence species growth and serve as transport for non-native species into an ecosystem and may change the balance of uh, the ecosystems. Second, uh, environmental impacts. Microplastics can contain or absorb toxic chemicals, potentially presenting a uh, toxicological risk for organisms that ingest them. When aquatic organisms in these plastic particles, microplastics and the chemicals they carry can make their way up the food chain. In fact, researchers have found microplastic in a variety of, uh, of the fish and shellfish that people consume. However, continued research is needed to fully understand that chemical risk associated with exposure to plastic deep uh, debris and microplastics. Marine debris pollution can also damage habitats, but the impacts are highly dependent on the type of debris and the characteristic of the ecosystems that it pollutes. For example, for example, marine debris can smooth the aquatic plants and corals and again uh, interfere with their growth. Finally, let us think about the social and economic impacts. Marine debris can lead to declining fish population, which might hurt communities that rely on fishery for uh, uh, in employment, income, and tourism. Once marine debris escape into the environment, 
cleaning it up is expensive, and this economic burden often falls on local governments and their residents. A 2009 study found that the U.S. spent about over then uh, 11.5 billion per year to clean up litter. Marine debris pollution can also cause damage to boats if the material tangle, uh, propellers, or clouds vessel intact. So next. Now, I think you have a best understanding of marine debris because I think you already know what is marine debris, the size and the categorize of the different uh, marine debris and also what is the microplastic and where they come from, what is their composition and how is the ocean dry, what is the plastic soup. And the final thing that you might want to know is how much marine debris is in the ocean and great lakes. Actually, it's very difficult to say. A study uh, by Burrell et al. estimated that in 2000, uh, 2016, as much as 23 million metro tons of plastic waste enter aquatic ecosystem from then around the world. If you can, you can image how much it is. Let us go to the next slide. So see, when we compare the different, like the building or, uh, or the tower or the blue whale and elephant. So if we look at the next, so if you calculate the amount of the plastic, can you go to the next? If you calculate uh, the amount of the uh, 23 million uh, marine debris divided by elephant's weight, 7.5 meg, 3,066,666.67. So you can image, now I think you can image how much uh, the, how much marine debris exists in the future. Can you go back to the previous slide? However, this number, may, although this number may feel huge, but it's not the whole picture because it doesn't include marine debris items not made of plastic or ocean based, uh, based marine debris, such as lost fishing gills and vessels. So again, uh, you can image that. It's really difficult to say, and we can assume there are much higher and higher uh, marine debris will exist in the ocean and great lakes. Next, next, and next. Okay, the final things. So I want to encourage everyone for, for solving marine debris pollution. We undoubtedly need commitment and global clean up strategies. We also need your innovations to develop a solution to reducing plastic waste and keeping it out of our oceans. Or we also need your innovations to raise more attention about these huge environmental issues. Okay, that's all. That's what I want to introduce for the marine debris. Thank you so much, Dr. Ko. We really appreciate you spending your time with us here today and sharing your expertise on the issue of marine debris. I think we got some inspiration too on some of the issues that we can tackle through the YIC this year. Um, and hi everyone, my name is Madeline. I'll just reintroduce myself really quickly. Um, I work for NAAAE and I support the Youth Innovation Challenge. And I'm just gonna talk about some of the YIC um, requirements, eligibility and selection criteria today. And then I'll pass it to Nina for some overall advice before we open up a short Q&A. So the Youth Innovation Challenge this year is all about tackling the issue of marine debris and empowering people to be stewards for marine ecosystems and environments. So there are many benefits to applying for the YIC this year. From our applicant pool, we'll pick 15 finalists who will receive an official certificate, global recognition through our websites and social media, and access to a growing global community of EE professionals and YIC alumni. From the finalists, we'll choose three winners who will be selected to receive a $1,000 USD prize, and that money could go towards implementing your solution. 
Finalists and winners will be announced November 22nd, so November of this year. And if you don't make the top this year, we also welcome you to ask for feedback and our judges will provide feedback on the solution that you submitted. There are a few eligibility requirements for both your solution and your application. So first for your solution, you must address one of four key topics regarding marine debris and include an environmental education component. And I'll talk about those two things a little more in depth in just a minute. Your application must include a video pitch of about three minutes, be submitted online through Submittable, which is um, the link to that is located on our website. And you know, maybe you could put our, our URL in the chat there. And your application must also be in English, including the video and the written responses. As an applicant, you should be between the ages of 15 and 30 years old, but you can be from anywhere in the world. And I also wanted to point out, again, this is on our website, we have um, a YIC applicant handbook. It details everything I'm talking about today and more. So it talks through the selection criteria a little bit more in depth, the timeline of the challenge, um, and provides some links to resources. And it also has all of the application questions. So we really highly encourage you to read through this in detail before you submit your application and then let us know if you have any questions. A few questions before I move on. Um, these ones we get often. So the first one is, can we apply as a team? And the answer is absolutely. We highly encourage collaboration. And we only ask that one person from the team is the person that's kind of like the leader that submits the application and that that person is between 15 and, 15 and 30 years of age. Another question we get often is, can I submit more than one solution? Um, we only allow you to submit one solution per person or one application per person. So we encourage you to choose your strongest, most innovative idea. And then finally, we often get asked, will you judge English language ability? Um, since you're submitting your application and your video all together in English, um, we, we don't judge any English language ability for either of those things. What our judges are looking for is the strength of your solution and your ability to communicate your ideas and your vision for your solution. Okay, and I'm gonna dive into a few of our selection criteria. So we have five total selection criteria that our judges will evaluate your solution on. Um, I'm gonna dive into each one individually. So the first selection criteria is that your solution should address one of the four following topics about marine debris. So monitoring and investigation of the amount or type of marine debris, cleanup of marine debris. It could be like cleanup of floating debris in the ocean or even ocean litter on the bottom, uh, the bottom floor of the ocean. Recycle and reuse of marine debris into useful products or engaging communities to address marine debris in their own community. Um, and maybe your solution includes all four of these or a few of them and that's fine too, as long as it addresses one. Our second selection criteria is that your solution must include an environmental education component. So environmental education provides the skills, values, attitudes, and behaviors that empower people and ind like individuals and groups to be thoughtful and engaged stewards for the environment. So including EE in your um, solution can, can ensure that you're, um, you're including an, you're empowering long-term change for your community um, within the issues of marine debris. So to sum it up, we like to say EE does these four things. It builds capacity for informed choices. Um, it integrates environmental goals within a, uh, the context of a specific community or a community interest. It supports collaborative and inclusive partnerships, um, understanding that people come from different backgrounds and there's a lot of diversity and perspectives. And it also focuses on empowering people to take positive action for the environment. So EE goes beyond just knowledge sharing or raising awareness. It equips people with the tools and the skills and the motivation to take action for the environment. And in this case, specifically for marine issues. 
Um, and so we'd like to say EE helps individuals and communities to gain these five things, awareness, knowledge, attitude, skills, and allowing them to participate um, to tackle these environmental problems. And so NAAAE has a great module called What is EE? And that's on our website, EE Pro, which is free to sign up. Um, and that resource is also in our YIC applicant handbook. So we encourage you to take a look at that and kind of go through that module, get a sense of what EE is and how you can, um, how you can include that in your solution more. And then let us know if you have any questions. Our third criteria is that your solution must be informed. We want to see that um, you're considering the complex social, economic, and or environmental dynamics within the issue of marine debris. And so we're looking for you to back up your solution with relevant research or evidence. This can come from books, scientific journals, websites, videos, anything that is a credible source really. And um, to ensure that it's a credible source, we also have another resource in our applicant handbook that can help you determine whether the source you're using is a credible one or not. Our fourth selection criteria is that your solution must be innovative. Um, and that means that it meets a need in your community using a new or better idea, practice, product, process, or strategy. Um, this can include applying an already existing tool or approach in a new context or engaging with new audiences, or it could be something entirely new. And the final selection criteria is that your solution must be feasible. We wanna see that you or your team have the necessary skills and experiences to ensure that your solution um, is viable in the long term. Um, and to do that, we wanna be, we wanna see that you're thoughtful about the types of potential challenges or risks that might occur um, as you're thinking long-term about your solution. All right, and with that, I wanna remind you again, like a broken record to check out our applicant handbook. Um, and I'm going to pass it on to Nina who'll provide some overall advice before we open it up for Q and A. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Madeline such a great overview of all of the different criteria that we have. So again, I'm going to repeat, go take a look at the handbook, read it in depth. You'll find a lot of helpful information there. All right. So some overall advice that we like to share with applicants to help you make your, uh, your submission even stronger. You, you've addressed all of the criteria, but what else can you do to make sure that you are submitting the best proposal that you can. So first of all, uh, the first point here, first of all, be as specific as you can uh, in order to give the judges a really clear image of your solution and how it will help solve issues of marine debris. So be, again, just be as specific as you can. Tell us exactly what your solution will do. Um, if you're talking about um, workshops or uh, any kinds of activities, give us as much detail as you can about what those will look like so that our judges can really see a really clear image of, of what exactly you plan to do with your solution. Next point is, um, again, along with being specific, provide as much detail as you can. The more detail you can, provide the better. And we encourage you to use the word count as a guide. So if a question has a 300 word limit, we really recommend that you use this to your advantage. Um, use, use that full amount of space uh, if you can to provide as, as much detail as you can and to be as specific as you can. The third point is to align your responses with the selection criteria in the handbook. So what Madeline has just gone over, make sure that all of your responses align as much as you can with that selection criteria, because that is exactly what the judges will be scoring on. We wanted to make it crystal clear with you. We wanted to be transparent with you what, how our judges will be uh, judging and scoring your submissions. And that is what the criteria are. That's what's in the handbook. So make sure that you align those um, with the selection criteria and, and you, that could help you get a, a stronger score. 
The next point is just, and this is like the last point, to overall tell us your story. So we want to know about your solution. We want to know how it aligns with all of those criteria. But we also want to know a little bit about you and if there's a story behind how or why you came up with the solution, how it meets a need in your community, how you found that need. Um, this can help you stand out from other applicants, maybe that also have strong, uh, strong solutions, but um, we want to also hear your story. How, how did you come across this, uh, the solution? How did you come up with the solution? What inspired you to, um, to put this forward for this challenge? So along with all of the criteria and providing as much detail, try to tell us your story as much as you can. And um, please keep in mind, the deadline is September 1st. We have shared all of the links in the chat to the handbook and to the website where you can also find the link to the application and submittable um, and be sure to get your submissions in before September 1st. And the next slide, we do have a few resources that we wanted to share with you. Um, I think you can just pull up all of these here. So um, these are great youth innovation challenge specific resources that we encourage you to explore. So uh, take a look at our FAQ page, our frequently asked questions. Madeline shared a few of them earlier, but we have a lot more on there. If you have a question, uh, of course, we encourage you to ask any questions here now, but after the webinar, if you have a question, take a look and see if it's on there. If it's not, please don't hesitate to reach out. We also have a, a list of 10 tips for a great video pitch. So we want to help you all put together a strong pitch. So take a look at that uh, website and go through and to, to find some great advice on putting together a strong video pitch. And we'll share all of these links in an email after this webinar as well. And of course, the link at the bottom there is, is to the, the program landing page that has all of these resources on it. And I think that is it. Um, thank you all so much for joining. Thank you so much again to all of our speakers, Dr. Wong and Dr. Ko, um, and Judy as well, and Madeline. Um, with that, we do have a few minutes here. Uh, we plan to stick around for another 15 minutes if you have any questions. Um, but again, thank you for joining us. And there is a question in the chat. I see who will be our one point contact if we have any doubts. So um, we do have the email. I will put in the chat here, jeep at nwa.org. So that is the email, our contact email. Um, we are more than happy to help with any questions that you have. So just email us there. All right, from Anne, a question. Should my video be about the solution only or should I talk about my story and the solutions to summarize my video? So in your video, we do want to hear about your solution, but I think if you're able to incorporate your story throughout your application in your pitch and in, in your written responses as well, that would be great. I think that will that could strengthen, uh, that will help you stand out perhaps a little bit. So um, do, make, however, make sure that um, if you are talking about your story, make sure that you still have enough space to provide sufficient detail about what your solution is. So make sure that you have a balance there. But yes, I think you could include both in the video. Any other questions? And Madeline, did you have anything to add on either of those questions so far? No, I think you captured it great. I think if you can fit your story in part of that three minute video pitch, that would be amazing, but we do recognize it is a short amount of time. So fitting it in in your written responses is great too. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, please again email us if you have any questions at all. 
we are really happy to help. We really want to help you submit the strongest proposal that you can. Um, so thank you again for joining. We will, you will have all of the links and a recording to this in your email. And we're so excited to, to read all of your great proposals. So thank you for joining.